Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of what is an absolutely spectacular spring Darien evening to be here for what promises to be a very important program. Um, I'm, I'm personally very happy to have the information we're going to receive tonight about um, ticks and tick-borne disease. I think it's an issue that is um, uh, not talked about enough and really sort of lives uh, in the undercurrent in our community with many people and many families suffering from uh, the impacts of tick-borne disease. So I'm looking forward to hearing from the wonderful professionals who are here tonight, Dr. Malai, Dr. McMillan, and Dr. Shaw here to share their expert knowledge with us. And of course, our local health director, David Knopf, um, and his staff who put on this wonderful program. Thank you very much for organizing. Well, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, th good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming. Um, this is, as Jamie said, a timely issue and one that we are all facing. You know, I grew up in Connecticut and uh, spent most of my days outside, you know, weather like this all summer long. And, uh, <clears throat> and here in New England, when I'm, I know I'm speaking for just about everyone, when we live for summer, we live for this kind of weather. And when I was growing up, the major thing that we had to watch out for and were concerned about was poison ivy and bees. Never thought about ticks, never thought, well, you know, you get a mosquito bite, it's just a mosquito bite. Um, but now public health officials like myself are warning people about new potential risks associated with our outside activities. No question about it, things have changed and they're continuing to change. So we're very fortunate tonight to have three experts here to talk about and help us understand how we can fight the bite and protect ourselves and our family while enjoying the beautiful weather and being outside. Um, and on behalf of the town, I'd like to express our appreciation for the, the experts tonight to take time out of their busy schedules to come here and speak to us. Um, <clears throat> and before we start, I'd like to ask you to, Paula, if you could pass out index cards. And so what we'd like to do is hold questions to the end and we'll have a panel discussion so that we can kind of have everybody do their presentations. And if you want to make notes of questions you might have, and ask them at the end. I think that'll help speed things along, make more sense. Our first two speakers tonight are with the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, which was established in 1875 as the first agricultural experiment station in the United States. The main mission of the uh, Ag Station has been research, educating people, and transferring new findings to people to try to solve agricultural, public health, and environmental problems. We are very fortunate to have this service in the state of Connecticut. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Gudars Malai to speak about ticks and the ticks system and program that we have in Connecticut. Dr. Malai. Hello and good evening. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for the invite, you. David and Paula. So uh, tonight I would like to talk about some of the issues that we have with ticks in our state. CDC recently reported that during the last 13 years, the number of diseases as a result of tick mosquito and fleas activity has tripled. However, 
nearly 94% of all diseases are tick-related diseases, and only 6% are the result of mosquito activity. So I would like to read this uh, with you. Uh, Tick-borne diseases are the Cinderella of vector-borne diseases systems, always beautiful but for so long overshadowed by the big ugly sisters of insect-borne malaria, trypanosomiasis, dengue, West Nile virus, etc. In traditional happy ending style, they are now emerging as the princess of vector-borne diseases. Their full significance is appreciated as important in temperate as tropical region and with an exquisite complexity to keep many of us fully occupied over a lifetime. Now, here in our state and throughout the Northeastern United States, we have nearly 15 tick species. However, the most abundant of those ticks are black-legged or deer tick, followed by American dog tick, and then Lone Star tick. Black-legged ticks are distributed throughout the eastern United States. Dog ticks uh, in the, to the east of Rocky Mountain region with some population in the west coast. And Lone Star tick is distributed or used to be distributed in southeastern United States, now we have in our region and further north. So this is the picture that probably you have seen in 2017. Uh, a, tick wa uh, a deer was discovered in Manresa Island here in the region, and it turns out that tick was heavily infested with Lone Star tick. So we looked at our historic data and we found out that we used to have 0.2% of ticks in our state being Lone Star tick. Now that 0.2% has risen to 3.2%. And the trouble is that this 3.2% of ticks are coming only from this particular region, Darien, Norwalk, Stanford, and neighboring towns. As if we didn't have enough problem with ticks, we recently in 2017 discovered a tick in New Jersey that is called Asian Longhorn Tick. And this tick has now moved to at least nine states. This tick is a serious livestock pest. In addition, it is involved in transmission of uh, some of the most important pathogens, including those closely related to Lyme disease, babesiosis, and anaplasmosis. In addition to this tick, we are routinely discovering some exotic ticks that we reported last year, and this year we are reporting another exotic tick coming from South America that is quite disturbing and alarming. So, the black-legged tick has a two-year lifestyle or lifespan. Female ticks, early spring, they lay eggs. Eggs develop into larvae. And throughout summer, larvae feed on small mammals and birds. So we don't have to be worried about larvae. But then larvae develop into nymph and nymphs overwinter, and the spring of following year, nymphs start feeding on large mammals, small mammals, and birds, and humans. And they continue, and in the fall of the second year, they develop into male and female, and male and female, they are usually active during the winter, and then the cycle continues. So based on the data that we have collected in our laboratory, we do see 
two peak activity for adult ticks that occur in April and May and a smaller peak in October and November and nymph peak uh, reaches a peak in June and early July. This is the time of the year that we have uh, greater prevalence of Lyme disease in humans. So why these uh, ticks are so much difficult and they are highly efficient vector of human diseases? First, they are abundant. A single black-legged tick can lay up to 3,000, sometimes more eggs, and each one of those eggs develop into a larvae and the cycle continues. They have host preference, unlike some other blood feeding arthropods, ticks, uh, two life stage of ticks, larvae and nymph could feed on a single host species. They, they have, compared to mosquitoes, they have a very long life cycle. Their life cycle takes two years, meaning that once they are infected, they can carry that infection and have the potential to transmit the disease agent to humans in comparison to mosquitoes that live maybe about uh, one month or two months. Their feeding methods, they have discovered that tick saliva carries at least 400 enzymes. Some of those enzymes have the proper, the priority, oh, sorry, the property uh, to numb the, the, the bite site, vasodilatory effect, and so many, so that they call right now tick uh, spit library to uh, having th that many enzymes. Now, ticks throughout the United States, they carry a number of uh, pathogen, at least 14 bacterial pathogen responsible for uh, nine diseases including Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and babesiosis. They also have the, the capability to carry viruses, at least four viruses. You can now add a new virus that's called Bourbon virus. That's a very nasty virus and Poisson virus. Dr. Shaw will uh, probably discuss Poisson viruses among the viruses that uh, infection with this virus could lead uh, to mortality in up to 40% of cases. And then we have a protozoan or single cell organism similar to malaria that is transmitted by black-legged ticks that, that causes babesiosis. So, majority of these uh, diseases are clustered in the Northeast and a few uh, a state in upper Midwestern United States. I will not discuss uh, disease, uh, clinical symptoms and others. Dr. Shah will uh, help us to, to deal with this issue. However, I, I would mention that Lyme disease is caused by a bacterium, by a spirochete called Borrelia burgdorferi. And the transmission is by the bite of black-legged tick. If you look at to the left of the uh, slide, these are the number of counties throughout the United States with established population of black-legged ticks that uh, has been doubled. And if you look at the number of Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases, you see that there is a clear uh, match between the population of uh, black-legged tick and the disease uh, prevalence throughout the country. So here in Connecticut, even though this slide shows that the number of Lyme disease cases uh, is going down, it is not really at least I believe it is not really the case. There are some irregularity with reporting and other things, and I still believe based on the number of ticks that we receive, uh, based on the infection rate that we see in ticks, I believe that the Lyme disease uh, 
cases are still high. Anaplasmosis and other bacterial diseases caused by Anaplasma phagocytophilum, this used to be called ehrlichiosis. Uh, the transmission is again by the bite of black legged tick. And here in our state, we, do, we have seen several hundreds of cases of anaplasmosis, and the highest number was in 2015. And babesiosis is, is a protozoan disease uh, similar to malaria, and symptoms uh, mimic that of malaria, and the transmission is by black like a tick as well. And as you can see, the number of babesiosis cases has uh, gone up substantially. And finally, the last uh, disease that is transmitted, or disease agent that is transmitted by black leg attack is the Poisson virus. That's a nasty disease agent, and it is transmitted by black leg attack and, and another uh, tick that is called woodchuck tick. So we have had, uh, throughout the country, we have had a little over 100 cases of Poisson virus over the last decade or so. So why are we seeing this much tick problem and tick-borne disease problem? The number one is the land use and land cover changes. I hope you all agree with me, or some of you agree with me, that we have changed the environment substantially. We have encroached upon to the areas that uh, did really belong to wildlife, and we have driven away wildlife from, from us, and we have kept only deer very dear to our heart. So that is creating a major problem. And in addition, not having uh, predators uh, and having small mammals like chipmunks and, and mice and other things uh, without having a tab on, on their population, that is creating major problem uh, with tick population. We have fragmented habitats, and I hope you uh, realize that. We have made changes in the vegetation, and we have changed the host community, uh, reservoir hosts versus reproductive hosts, deer population, and, and so on and so forth. And well, part of the uh, rises that we see in tick-related disease could be related to increased diagnosis and reporting, and I want to also mentioned climate change is a factor. I hope you are not going to report me to the <laughs> immigration offices. So how about in the northeastern United States? We have had, in 2017, we have had nearly 33,000 uh, Lyme disease cases. Last year, in 2018, we have had 60,000 uh, tick-borne diseases, majority of these diseases uh, are in the northeastern United States. So one reason for increases in tick-borne diseases, I believe, is, is due to warmer winter, shorter winter, expanded and extended summer and, and spring time. That permits not only tick populations to, to, to thrive, and also helps the rodent population. And I hope you agree with me also, uh, although deer for Lyme disease is not a competent, reserve, competent host, nonetheless it provides ample opportunity for ticks to uh, get much needed blood and use that blood for their reproduction to, pro to uh, prepare and to lay uh, thousands of eggs. So based on a passive surveillance that we have here in the state of Connecticut in our institution, about 80% of ticks uh, are black-legged ticks followed by dog tick uh, about 17% and now, as I mentioned, 3.2% are the lone star ticks. 
If we look at our historic data during the last decades, we, you, have, you, you uh, can realize that the tick abundance has gone up so has the, the prevalence of infection. I was telling to uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Konoff that uh, this year already we have reached 45% of infection. In other words, uh, one out of two ticks are infected, at least with one disease agent. This is our 2018 data. You see that nearly 50% of ticks are infected at least when, with one pathogen. Nearly 40% with, with Lyme disease, 12% with anaplasmosis, 10% with babesiosis. To make the matter worse, we are seeing more and more ticks infected with more than one disease agent. Meaning that if someone is bitten, if I am bitten by a tick that carries two or three pathogens at the same time, you can imagine how difficult the task is for Dr. Shah to diagnose and to come up with a proper treatment. So here is uh, the analysis that we have done uh, on our over three decades of data, uh, and we just got it published uh, this week. As you can see, majority of ticks that we are receiving are coming from uh, populated counties like Fairfield and, and New Haven. However, the prevalence of infection in ticks is in more rural counties. And we, if, when we look at the Lyme disease cases, we do see nice association between the uh, prevalence of infection in ticks and the Lyme disease cases. So we now have mapped the entire state showing each, count, each county and town uh, with prevalence of infection uh, with nymphs, uh, particularly with nymphs. The reason that I am emphasizing on nymphs uh, because they are small in size and it is very difficult to identify them and quite often we do see that Lyme disease cases increases during the time that we have higher abundance of nymphal ticks. So, what can we do? The most important suggestion or advice that I could offer is be aware of your surrounding. Do not please uh, take it lightly. We live in a state that is endemic for Lyme disease and we have a perseverant population of uh, black like tick. So, wooded areas, uh, brushy areas and grassy areas are the areas that you are at greater risk. Try to avoid those areas. You don't have to go to neighborhood parks in order to encounter ticks. 75% of Lyme disease cases are contracted in your own backyard. The minute that you step away from your manicured lawn to the wooded area, you are at risk of contracting Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases. When you are going to parks, please consider walking in the center of the trails and do not try to uh, explore the areas outside the trails. Wear light colored clothing. This is what we do all the time as researchers. When we go outside, we can't take risk. Always we do that. Tuck your pants into your socks and use repellents. Use these, you can use these on your skin directly. However, uh, I do believe that uh, DEET is not as effective as it is against mosquitoes. So please uh, be mindful of the, it may provide some kind of protection, but not greater protection. Instead, you can use pesticide on your clothes. What you can do, you can buy some of these 
uh, available pesticide from hardware store and apply those pesticides onto your clothes and then once it is dry you can put those clothes on and you can go for outdoor activity after you return you can take those clothes off and put it outside and it is believed that the pesticide can remain active uh, for three consecutive washes, even at um, exposure to uh, dryer heat. So perform tick checks. This is important. You have to perform that every three hours after your outdoor activity. You have to look for underarms, in and around the ears, inside the belly button, back of the knees, in and around head and the body hair between the legs and around the waist. And keep pets free. I can't emphasize enough in most cases that our children, as young as 10 month old, uh, we receive many ticks from these younger, removed from these younger kids. And it is mostly due to uh, pets bringing these ticks to uh, inside the home and, and then ticks start biting these kids. And you can imagine Dr. Shaw, uh, I, I believe that she appreciates how difficult it is dealing with these younger uh, children that they cannot speak and they cannot uh, mention what uh, symptoms are and what they are suffering from. So now, the conclusion, tick-borne diseases will continue to be a major health concern and additional pathogens will rise. We will see range expansion of ticks as we see with Lone Star tick and other ticks and disease expansion as well. The rate of co-infection, meaning that a tick being infected with more than one pathogen will increase. And there are uncertainty in critical aspects of tick-borne diseases that needed or needs to be addressed. Fortunately, CDC and other regulatory agencies are uh, dealing with these issues and they are investing in tick-borne diseases uh, substantially. And there is an urgent need for efficient and effective widely accepted approach to prevent tick-borne diseases. Finally, I would like to extend my appreciation to so many people. First of all, I would like to pay tribute to Dr. Louis McMurali, who was a prominent scientist tick working on tick and mosquito-borne diseases who passed away quite early in his life. Dr. John Anderson used to direct the tick testing program and the passive surveillance at the station before I took over. Dr. Andriades uh, is the current director of experiment station and Dr. Eliza Little, who is a modeler, helping us to understand the mathematical aspects of uh, tick-borne diseases. And this is the family of uh, tick testing laboratory. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Moore is a research scientist. Okay, thanks. It'll be brief here. I'm just going to be very brief. And director of the passive surveillance tick to surveillance and testing program at the Ag Station. Passive surveillance is really about local jurisdictions just collecting ticks that folks bring in to, in our case, into the health department offices. We send them off to the Ag Station for testing. Um, so the passive survey is not that the agency is not going out collecting ticks. It's up to folks to bring in the ticks. We send them in. We get send them out for testing. You get the results. We let you know. Uh, the lab turnaround time right now, doctor, is about 
10 days maybe because you're getting so many submissions associated with the nice weather i wish you had to ask that question <laughs> i i i ideally I, I want to say two or three days but the t says we are busy now, seven to ten days yeah because that's always a question folks have when they come in with the ticks is how long and so you know, I'm, I'm aware of the uh, stressors associated with uh, so many coming in right now. Um, but I did want to mention that you published numerous research articles in peer-reviewed journals and research on the role of mosquitoes and birds in transmission and amplification of West Nile virus as well, and was recognized as one of the top 100 discoveries in 2005. And thank you for the work that you do. We appreciate that. Thank you again. Next, I'd like to introduce also from the Ag Station is um, Joseph McMillan. He's a postdoctoral research scientist with the Agricultural Station Experiment Station, where his research focuses on the dynamics and control of mosquito-borne viruses in urban environments. Dr. McMillan is currently working with the Agricultural Station to develop protocols that evaluate the ability of current and novel mosquito control interventions to reduce mosquito-borne disease exposure risks to humans. And with that, Dr. McMillan. Good or not, there are mosquitoes here too. Um, and as we're here in a library, I thought I'd reference some literature in my talk title. So you can believe my story today or not. Um, so a brief kind of outline of what I've put together um, to talk to you guys about today. I've kept it to the basics, kind of universal principles of just different aspects of mosquito biology, what you do in terms of control to impact those behaviors. Um, and then a little bit more of a breakdown of different types of mosquito control techniques, both personal um, at a private landowner level and also at a public level. So I always like to start out with a little bit of history. Um, so while mosquito-borne diseases have been with humans probably since humans became humans, it not, has not been that long that we've known that mosquitoes and ticks transmit diseases. So beginning in about 1870, in the 1870s, people st really started to question, like, what are making these people sick with different things? Uh, Patrick Manson first showed that Culex quinquefasciitis um, actually <coughs> acquires uh, the blood worms from humans when it takes a blood meal. Um, I believe in Cuba, Carlos Finlay, who was kind of thought as this crazy guy who said that mosquitoes transmitted a uh, yellow fever, let Aedes aegypti feed on someone sick with yellow fever, let those same mosquitoes feed on a person who wasn't sick. Um, and so he was really kind of, history has shown that he's really the first one to demonstrate that. And then kind of the famous one here is Ronald Ross. Um, he actually was showed what uh, the life cycle of bird malaria. And it was an Italian researcher named Giovanni Grassi that actually showed that it was Anopheles mosquitoes that were transmitting malaria on humans. Um, and I put down here this little what's called a simple equation for mosquito-borne diseases, and you can call it Grassi's Law or not. And you really have to have all of the pieces, all three pieces plus their interactions together in order to have mosquito-borne diseases. You have to have mosquitoes, you have to have the disease, and you have to have humans or hosts getting infected with the disease or with the, the pathogen. And that's really what's created um, the diseases. So, in Connecticut was not immune to the history of mosquito-borne diseases. There were outbreaks of malaria um, from the 1600s into the late 1800s. I took this from John Anderson's uh, history of, of public health in Connecticut. Um, and here are kind of listed years that they found that there were outbreaks of malaria here in <coughs> Connecticut. And the last outbreak reported was in 1912 in Greenwich. And as of 1951, malaria, malaria has been eradicated from the United States. There are no locally acquired cases of um, malaria. T typically, people get it abroad and they bring them back. We also had yellow fever here in Connecticut. Um, yellow fever is different from malaria. It's a viral disease. It's kind of much more intense, much more uh, like catastrophic to the body. 
And um, at least in the South, I was interested in reading a history that there would be an outbreak of yellow fever in a city and people would just disappear. You know, and I imagine the same kind of thing happened here. People were that scared of this virus. And there were pretty big outbreaks here um, in Connecticut. In the United States, this disease has also been eliminated. And the last outbreak was in New Orleans in 1905. Kind of since then, we've seen this global reemergence of arboviruses. Um, we've seen the resurgence of dengue in the tropics. It's increased, the human case rate has increased, increased 30 fold since 1950. Uh, chikungunya virus, which is um, an, another similar type of um, 80s born disease, is now prevalent in the tropics. Um, and there's also been outbreaks in Italy and La Reunion Island um, in a mosquito species that isn't typically associated um, with, this, with these viruses. We all are familiar with Zika virus, I assume. Um, and that large outbreak in Brazil. And then also, even though yellow fever has been eradicated from most of the world, there have been recent outbreaks um, in Angola as well as in Brazil. Um, an interesting thing about dengue and chikungunya and Zika is that they seem to be able to co-circulate. So this is from the Pan American Health Organization down here. And you have the blue bars, which are dengue virus. And then you have orange bars that are chikungunya and green bars that are Zika. So they're all kind of occurring in the same spatial, or in the same temporal time frame. And then this is from some of um, my collaborators where I was at Emory, and this is the town of Merida in the Yucatan of Mexico. And the gray areas are where they have hot spots of dengue virus. And then the red spots are where they have hot spots of chikungunya and Zika. So they're capable of being transmitted in not only in the same time, but also in the same space. Here in North America and Connecticut, uh, West Nile virus is really kind of in the forefront of what we're thinking about in terms of mosquito-borne diseases. Um, and from the CDC, a human case of West Nile virus was reported in every state except New Hampshire and Hawaii in 2018. And mosquitoes and the diseases that they transmit, they've been around forever and they're probably not going away anytime soon. And the world is kind of increasing, increasingly viral and wild. And what I mean by wild is that a number of these viruses emerging, and most of the viruses that we monitor here in the state of Connecticut are wildlife viruses. They're transmitted among mosquitoes and different wildlife species, and humans kind of get exposed to them as an accident. Those exposures can be very um, severe in some people, which is why we want to monitor them. And also, control of mosquitoes, not just for diseases, is also important from local economies. So controlling salt marsh mosquitoes helps people enjoy the environment. It helps keep your uh, summer hotels filled. Um, and pe here, people spending money. In terms of control at a state level, um, I believe current control is through uh, DEEP. Um, I found this. They do some control on different marshlands throughout the state. But most mosquito control is either done at the level of the town or at a personal level here in Connecticut. A quick advertisement for what the station is doing in terms of surveillance of the viruses here in the state is unlike what uh, Gudarez, Dr. Malawi, uh, presented, we do um, active surveillance. So we have, there are 92 trapping locations throughout Connecticut that are sampled on about a 10 week schedule from the months of June to October. And when um, a virus is de detected in some of these sites, the station will kind of sample that site more frequently. Yeah, I don't know if you can see very well, but the, the sites where they sample are all these little white dots on the map. So the viruses that the station is looking for, we can break down into kind of two different subsets. You have mammalian arboviruses, which are viruses that are in deer and squirrels and chipmunks, mammalian. Um, and I've highlighted which ones are capable of causing human illness. So there's cash, so they're all buniviruses, um, and you can call them by their kind of colloquial names. There's Cache Valley Fever, Jamestown Canyon, La Crosse, uh, and Trivitatus. Uh, and I've listed the seasonality of them. A lot of these viruses, uh, they kind of occur throughout the summer. They're kind of always present. And then the avian viruses, so these are ones that are transmitted between mosquitoes and birds. You have eastern equine encephalitis, 
um, and West Nile virus, which are the two really main ones that the station is monitoring for. And these also tend to be the most severe infections in humans. So Eastern equine um, is very prevalent in um, late summer, and typically in terms of the station's data, it's detected in forested wetlands, and these sites tend to occur on the eastern portion of the state. You don't get outbreaks every summer, and we were talking in the car on the way down here, there hasn't really been um, an outbreak in quite a while. Um, West Nile virus occurs every year in the state. Um, the greatest risk period of West Nile virus is mid to late summer. Um, and West Nile virus really strongly associates with urban sites. And in the state of Connecticut, that's the I-95, I-91 corridor. So when this, the station detects any of these viruses, kind of this chain reaction occurs. Connecticut Department of Public Health is notified, so is Department of Environmental uh, Protection. And then DPH contacts local health departments, which disse start disseminating that information to the public. The station also reports to CDC Arbonet, which is kind of a national database of mosquitoes and arboviruses transmitted in the United States. The station also um, produces kind of some graphics online through their website. Um, they have a map and they have kind of a cumulative um, case res result. Might be, so this is actually, I have slides out of order. But so something like this is kind of updated every week that trapping information comes in and virus isolations are made. And this is on the website the whole time. And the station, to back up a slide, is part of five state agencies monitoring for mosquito-borne viruses in the state. So they have the ag station that's doing active mosquito surveillance, so looking for mosquitoes and testing them for viruses. Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, which is your mosquito control and environmental management resource. Department of Public Health is the epidemiology of human cases. Department of Agriculture monitors any sort of veterinary cases, so things like horses, your pets. And then there's a pathology department at UConn, um, which will do necroscopies, testing um, deceased animals or tissue samples. So in terms about the biology of mosquitoes and kind of what, how you can use the, their biology as guides for control, I thought I'd first kind of start by explaining exactly what a mosquito is. My wife always sits outside and she's like, mosquitoes are biting me. And there's all sorts of little bugs out there that bite you. And mosquitoes are a very specific type of thing. And these are kind of the things, that, these characteristics are what make a mosquito a mosquito. It's got a three-part body. So it has the head, thorax, and the abdomen. And it has six legs, compound eyes, and a pair of antenna. What really makes it a mosquito is right here is this proboscis. This is its uh, mouth piercing part, the bit where it, you know, that's the part that uh, pierces you for blood. And you can kind of see some of these same characteristics in a mosquito larvae. So mosquito larvae have a head and a, a thorax and an abdomen. And this right here is their kind of like breeding tube. So when you see them in the water, that's how they're getting oxygen. You can tell the different types of mosquitoes from just the way they look in the environment. So the way mosquitoes, the larvae hang in the water can tell you a little bit about the genera of species it is. So Anopheles mosquitoes, which are the ones that transmit malaria, they actually don't really have a very big um, siphon to get oxygen, so they have to be right up against the surface of the water. Whereas the other mosquitoes, so the culicine forms, these are the culic species that transmit West Nile virus, culicida that transmits Eastern equine encephalitis, they kind of hang low in, in the water. So you can kind of use this as a visual cue of what kind of mosquitoes are out and present. So these same kind of things translate to what the adult mosquitoes look like where they're resting or feeding. So the Anopheles mosquitoes tend to be in a totally straight line when they're resting on a surface or even when they're blood feeding. And whereas the Culis sign form, so the Culix, the ones that transmit West Nile, and Culicida that transmits Eastern Equine, they kind of sit. Um, have like a little bit of a dihedral. I doubt many of you are gonna let the mosquito land on you and actually look at it. Um, but it is interesting that you can tell a little bit about the mosquito from just the way it's behaving. Finally, male mosquitoes and female mosquitoes are different. Again, you're not gonna look and see what the, which one's on you, but you can typically distinguish a male mosquito that has these really bushy antenna, right? 
So in terms of the life cycle of a mosquito, we'll just get to the part everyone cares about, and that's the blood feeding. So what we're here to, to learn about and to learn how to, um, to stop it. So only female mosquitoes take a blood meal, and they don't do it because they're hungry. So mosquitoes can get the energy they need to lead the life they lead every day from feeding on nectar or sugar sources. What they need the blood for is that it's, necessary, it's a necessary nutrient for them to produce their eggs. And so it's a really strong driving force for the mosquitoes. You know, she needs that to produce her young. Um, would I be allowed to show, there's a clip from PBS, like a minute long, of what it like, looks like when a mosquito blood feeds. Is that okay to show? This is the deadliest animal in the world. Mosquitoes kill hundreds of thousands of people each year. The most vulnerable people, children, pregnant women. No other bite kills more humans or makes more of us sick. So what makes a mosquito's bite so effective? For starters, they're motivated. Only females bite us. They need blood to make eggs. And a pool of water for their babies to hatch in. Even a piece of trash can hold enough. At first glance, it looks simple, this mosquito digging her proboscis into us. But the tools she's using here are sophisticated. First, a protective sheath retracts. See it bending back? If you look at a mosquito's head under a microscope, you can see what that sheath protects. And inside there are six needles. Two of them have tiny teeth. She uses those to saw through the skin. They're so sharp, you can barely feel her pushing. These other two needles hold the tissues apart while she works. From under the skin, you can see her probing, looking for a blood vessel. Receptors on the tip of one of her other needles pick up on chemicals that our blood vessels exude naturally and guide her to it. Then she uses this same needle like a straw. As her gut fills up, she separates water from the blood and squeezes it out. See that drop? That frees up space to stuff herself with more nutritious red blood cells. With another needle, she spits chemicals into us. They get our blood flowing more easily and give us itchy welts afterwards. And sometimes, before she pries herself away, she leaves a parting gift in her saliva a virus or a parasite that can sicken or kill us. There's nothing in it for her. The viruses and parasites are just hitching a ride. But this is what makes mortal enemies out of us and mosquitoes. They take our blood. Sometimes we take theirs. But often not soon enough. Good, you're still there. These are the larvae of Culex pipiens, AKA the common house mosquito here in California. Gross, right? Well, you can avoid them by emptying your rain gutters, pet water dishes too. While you're at it, subscribe. We have so many more science videos coming your way. See you next time. So what a mosquito is feeding on is really kind of determining what viruses it's encountering and what viruses it's likely to transmit to the next host. And so to really just kind of explain what I've done here is I've taken all of the data at the station, all of the viruses they've isolated from different mosquito species, and I've told this program to kind of graph them based on virus species associations. And just like what the station um, surveys for, you can see that the viruses break out into what are the mammalian viruses and the avian viruses. And so what this means is that the species transmitting West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis virus and another virus called Highlands J. These are species that bite birds. 
they are the most likely to encounter the virus and probably the most likely to expose humans to the virus, which means that a large portion of human exposure to West Nile virus comes from a infected mosquito that's not quite acting like it's supposed to. It's biting something else. And then you have the mammalian blood feeders. So these are species that tend to bite when we do the blood meal isolations, mammalian species. What I found is very interesting is that you have this kind of grouping of a virus called Jamestown Canyon. And this strongly associates with mosquitoes that are, that are called snowmelt species. Coming from Georgia, I didn't realize that there were mosquitoes that bred in, what they do is when the snow melts, their eggs that are kind of in the edge of the, the leaves, when they flood, these mosquitoes only kind of live in this like one seasonal environment. And what's cool is that the virus can be transmitted from mother to offspring. So every winter when these mosquito, when spring, when these mosquitoes release, they're kind of restarting the transmission cycle. So mosquitoes acquire and transmit their viruses through the act of blood feeding. And that's so important to keep in mind when we talk about mosquito disease prevention. And so this is a paper on Zika virus where they've taken the virus and somehow made it so that it shows up in almost like a, like a black light. They've tagged it so that as it's replicating in the mosquito's gut, you can see where it is in the body. And so in this figure right here, you see that right after the mosquito takes a blood meal, um, all these little green dots right here, this is right in the belly, this is right in the abdomen, the midgut of the mosquito. And then after a few days, you start to see the virus replicate and show up in different places. So it's kind of expanded throughout the gut. It gets into the mosquito's bloodstream, which is called, it's the hemolymph, that's not blood. And then it starts going into the, throughout the body. And you can, then you can start seeing it here in the head. And after about a week, the virus is everywhere in the mosquito when it's totally infectious. And so we, when we're thinking about exposure in mosquitoes, we're kind of thinking about um, mosquitoes at different stages of this virus replication process. <laughs> you have a mosquito that's just exposed to the virus. It's not quite infectious yet. You have a mosquito, what I've highlighted here, kind of in this yellow color. color. A few days after exposure, the virus starts to develop in the body. A few days later, the virus starts to end up in different parts of the mosquito, its legs, um, its thorax, its head. And after about a week or two weeks, it ends up in the salivary glands. And so that when it bites the next um, host, it's likely that it's going to be transmitting the virus. So we'll use West Nile virus as kind of an example of what this wildlife virus um, looks like in terms of humans. So, like I said, mosquitoes and birds, it's a cycle like this. Mosquitoes bite a bird, they get infected, they go through that period, they go on and bite another one and the cycle continues. And then every now and then, a human gets bit, or a horse gets bitten from these mosquitoes that have West Nile virus, and that's how humans are getting exposed. So in terms of interrupting mosquito blood feeding, it's really all about limiting the encounters between host seeking and infectious mosquitoes and humans. And so that means kind of fighting the bite or avoiding the bite. That means using repellents on yourself. I know we just talked about being in New England summers and spending time outdoors and being carefree, but limiting times outdoors when mosquitoes blood feeds is a very um, good behavior in terms of avoiding being bitten. Um, for most mosquitoes, that's kind of the dawn dusk period. Um, limiting time outdoors when disease transmission is most active. So when the station is reporting that there's tons of West Nile virus out, you know, that kind of midsummer time period, that's when the risk is highest. Also in terms of your own personal protection, that's improving how household and workplace infrastructure. It's preventing um, holes in your window screens. Um, fixing cracks in your doors, anything to prevent mosquitoes from getting into your indoor space, your screened in porch, whatever it is. And then probably the most common point of control for mosquitoes in the life cycle is this kind of aquatic phase where the, the eggs, the larvae, and the pupae. And as we're all familiar, mosquitoes use just about anything that holds water to lay their eggs and breed their, um, the next generation. Um, 
and some of these associations are pretty species dependent. And then some of these um, habitats host all sorts of different kinds of species. So I thought, just like I showed you earlier, not, no one's going to look in the water and see what's in there. But I think it's kind of cool to see that mosquitoes kind of use different strategies to lay their eggs. And those different strategies really kind of determine what you're trying to do in terms of controlling mosquito eggs and mosquito larvae. So the species that transmit West Nile virus, and I believe Eastern equine encephalitis, so that's your Culic species that transmit West Nile and Culicida that transmit Eastern equine. They lay these egg rafts. And so there's anywhere from 100 to 400 eggs in this little um, raft. Um, they lay it on the surface of the water and the mosquitoes hatch pretty quickly afterwards. And then you have mosquito species that lay individual eggs. And this is where it can get really tricky in terms of control because some species, um, 80 species in particular, they don't actually lay their eggs on the water. They lay their eggs just above the surface of the water on like a grass blade on the edge of your your flower pot outside, any sort of bucket you have. And then when it floods, those mosquitoes emerge. So you can check your water and you might not see that there's larvae in there, but that doesn't mean there's not eggs around the corner, around the edges of the water and that when it rains that those mosquitoes will emerge. The species that transmit malaria, they lay their eggs actually on the surface water and like the egg rafts, they will hatch shortly after being laid. So this kind of presents a really complex mixture of habitat characteristics and mosquito behavior that really kind of determines what you're trying to do to control mosquitoes. So things around your house such as like containers, you can dump them and they can probably will get rid of any larvae that are already in there or any eggs perhaps laid by a culic species in there. But there still could be eggs on the surface just waiting to be flooded again. Um, in terms of these larger habitats like these, these snowmelt pools, that just blows my mind. <laughs> That's a whole level of control that I don't think anyone has really ever thought about yet. But we are at the station, it's working on it. So I'll break it down now in terms of just really the main points of mosquito control. So I showed that Grassy's Law before and I really wanted to update it to show <coughs> just all the different factors that go into mosquito-borne diseases. You have mosquitoes, you have the virus, you have the host, you have the interactions between all the three. And then you have the environment really driving these, these interactions together. And so as it's summertime, a lot of these um, interactions are gonna accelerate and it's gonna be really important to start thinking about mosquito control at a personal and public level. So mosquito control for the diseases in transmitted in Connecticut is the most common and widespread form of arvovirus control. That's because many of these diseases are transmitted by wildlife, so there's no vaccines for humans, no one's going to be happy if you go out and cull wildlife. And there are no current technologies that could clear infections from mosquitoes or from the hosts. There are vaccines for West Nile and Eastern equine for horses, but that's it. So to control mosquitoes here in Connecticut, we use an integrated pest management approach, which means that you want to use a lot of different tools to reduce mosquito populations and prevent um, mosquito biting. That means eliminating breeding habitats, reducing larval populations, reducing adult populations, and interrupting contacts between humans, pets, livestock, and biting mosquitoes. So in terms of larval control, you can really call it larval source management. And under that broad umbrella of what to do about larval control, the first one is source removal. And that means literally getting rid of the aquatic habitat, totally removing it. It's gone. Nothing can ever breed there again. That's things like filling in um, wetlands, uh, draining wetlands, um, concreting out catch basins, it's gone. And then you have what's called source reduction. And these are methods that reduce larval populations but do not eliminate the larval habitat itself. You can have physical control, so you can enhance drainage. Um, you can clear waterways, improve water flow, especially in wetlands, trying to bring it back to a normal state of flow, ebb and flow. You can have biological control which means that you introduce living organisms like fish or these little kind of um, water organisms called copepods that will, are predators of mosquito larvae that will eat the mosquito larvae. You can also apply biocides, which are biological agents that are specific to mosquito larvae that as the mosquitoes are feeding in the water, they accumulate these toxins and then they eventually die. 
There's also chemical control, which are things like insect growth regulators. And I threw oils in there. No one uses oils to control mosquitoes. That's what they did. It was like one of the first uses of gasoline. They just put it in the water and it creates that layer on top of the, of the water surface that the mosquitoes can't breathe through. Um, insect growth regulators, I do not believe are used here in Connecticut. Um, other states use them, but Connecticut does not. Um, in terms of larval source management as where you're applying it, in terms of your own private property, that it would be eliminating habitats or reducing the habitat. So removing trash and debris that hold water. And then there's what they call tip and toss. So dump whatever's collecting water that can be turned over, leave it up there so it can collect or treat it if it's something that can't be um, removed, something like a fish pond or something like that. At a public sector, that means for West Nile virus, treating catch basins, storm drains, retention ponds with larvicides. These are habitats that are common in developed spaces that if left untreated could be huge breeding spaces for mosquitoes. Um, removing trash and debris in stuff, stuff like wetlands um, that, that limit water flow. So maintaining good water flow on public lands, um, as well as modifying or treating wetlands when you can't um, control them through physical manipulation also enforcing drainage regulations and cleaning catch basins and things like that, keeping waters that are there, you know, pretty clean. In terms of adult mosquito control, at a first level, we're talking about reducing human and mosquito contacts. Just as before, it's the infected mosquitoes when it bites you is what transmits the disease. So the first thing to do is to prevent that bite. So in terms of your own human space, you can modify your habitat at screen your windows and porches, eliminate points of ingress and egress for mosquitoes to enter a human dwelling. You can also clear debris and kind of scrubby growth around your house that mosquitoes use to rest during the day or to feed at night. Um, there's also personal protection. So just like with ticks, the clothes you wear can um, help prevent mosquito bites. So that's long sleeve shirts, pants, closed toed shoes, face nets, whatever you feel comfortable with wearing to prevent exposed skin from getting in contact with a mosquito. There's also bug spray and other repellents. The EPA has a really great resource on what um, kind of data is out there on repellents that work. Um, there's also, um, especially for small children, acceptable uses for um, certain types of products. And like we just discussed before, there's behavioral modification. So this is avoid being outside during uh, times when mosquitoes are most active or periods when transmission is um, very intense. So there's also adult control in the concept of actually reducing adult numbers. And I've noticed kind of nationally there's been this trend of kind of backyard spray barrier treatments. Um, I've heard of some homeowners associations doing truck mounted fogging. So these are actually using chemicals that are sprayed out into the environment. They either kill mosquitoes when they're out host seeking or it kind of coats the surface and when mosquitoes land on that surface, they're exposed to the chemical and they die. At a larger scale, and this is typically much more public sector, you have aerial applications. And in places like swamps, um, especially in the south and also in the Midwest, um, this is actually a pretty common technique and this is done really to control nuisance mosquitoes. These are mosquitoes that are very aggressive biters of humans. Um, they don't tend to transmit too many diseases, but they're the mosquitoes that chase you indoors. And if they don't hit that swamp at the right time, no one's going outside. There are also instances where public health um, authorities will deem an emergency. And um, this is what this is. This is an airplane, a military airplane, applying um, insecticides over a field during an outbreak. Um, and that is something that's possible. It's very, very, very uncommon. Very uncommon. It's kind of your last line of defense. So I've listed some resources here of where you can find out information about not only mosquitoes and control, but also relevant to here in Connecticut. And just a reminder that your mosquito problems are not your neighbor's fault. You know, they're kind of, um, requires everyone's investment to really reduce uh, adult mosquitoes and the diseases they carry. So, thank you. One of the things about mosquitoes, 
the most deadly animal in the world, causes the most deaths. Um, according to the World Health Organization, mosquito bites result in the deaths of over a million people a year. So it's, it's a significant little bug. Um, majority, as, as the doctor said, majority are, are due to malaria, and fortunately, we're not faced with that threat here, at least not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we also have this evening to talk about illness and treatment, particularly for ticks. Um, Dr. Shah, who is from a board certified infectious disease specialist and has been with Stanford Health System and Stanford Health Medical Group for seven years. She did her internal medicine training at the University of Pennsylvania, followed by an infectious disease fellowship at Columbia University Medical Center, Masters of Epidemiology, and is currently Associate Director of Infectious Diseases and Hospital Epidemiologist at Stanford Hospital. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. There's so much in the world of tick-borne diseases, and so um, I'm specifically going to focus on Lyme disease and essentially just the bread and butter of symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment. So Lyme disease was uh, first recognized in the United States um, in 1977, and it was due to a geographic clustering of children in Lyme, Connecticut, um, and they were initially thought to have juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It was later discovered that they, in fact, had Lyme disease. Um, previous to this, it had been recognized in Europe, um, and it was called, you know, different names. Um, and it's currently the most common tick-borne infection in the U.S. and in Europe. So as was mentioned earlier tonight, um, it's um, caused by a spiral-shaped bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi, um, and it's spread by the bite of infected um, Ixodes ticks. Um, the primary reservoir for Borrelia um, are rodents, especially the white-footed mouse. Um, and in the U.S., 14 states um, account for about nine, the majority of the cases. Um, and this was kind of mentioned, um, I'll show you a map that's similar to a map that was shown earlier. Um, it's also found in Europe, Russia, China, and Japan. Um, and so this is from the CDC, um, but basically showing you where, um, you know, the, we're seeing this instance of Lyme disease in the United States. Again, the majority are seen in just this um, small number of states. So you've seen pictures of these already, so I'll skip on skip that so um, after a tick attaches to a human um, the tick swells with blood and excretes water via salivary glands into the host um, and this is what passes um, the organism to the host so the important part here is to know that it takes 36 to 48 hours or more after attachment for the organism to spread to the host and this becomes important when we get questions, um, you know, about, you know, I found a tick on my child and what do I do, you know, and so the time that the tick's been um, attached is actually very important. And as you'll see, that plays an important role in the decision whether to give patients prophylaxis for Lyme disease. Um, so a small tick that's firmly attached but not engorged is likely not infectious. So who's at risk for Lyme disease? Um, active children spending time outdoors, um, outdoor occupations, forest rangers, landscapers, outdoor recreation, things like we like to do in the summertime, and then gardeners um, where there are deer, mice, um, or near the forest edge. Um, bird feeders can tend to be um, a risk. Um, they tend to attract mice and old stone walls um, in your backyard and it, as part of your landscaping um, can also be um, places where mice can nest. So just briefly about the symptoms of Lyme disease. So there's three phases. Um, the first is what we call early localized disease. This is um, a set of symptoms that occurs within days to weeks after a tick bite. The classic um, a rash that we see is called erythema migrans, and that's kind of that bullseye 
target lesion that I know many of you have probably seen or heard about. I'll show you some pictures. And the symptoms are fairly nonspecific. So fatigue, malaise, headache, myalgias, arthralgias, um, low-grade fever. Patients feel like they have the flu, you know, and they can't get out of bed for a couple of days. Um, so it's, it's a little bit tricky because you may think that you have some sort of viral syndrome. So this is an example of um, an erythema migraines rash. You see kind of this target type lesion here. Um, here are some more. These are multiple um, on a patient um, and a few more as well. And one more big one. So this type of rash occurs in up to 90% of infections and it's usually less than one month after a bite from a tick. Um, it's us they usually occur near the armpit, the groin, behind the knees or at the belt line ticks like warm, moist places. So that's a good way to kind of remember where to look for these types of rashes. There's usually no symptoms, so they're, they're not really painful. Um, they can itch, uh, but they tend to be, you know, these patients are completely asymptomatic in terms of the rash. Um, they expand over a few days, and they may have this central clearing of redness, and that's the bullseye experience, uh, appearance that I just showed you. 10% um, of um, cases, in 10% of cases, people can have multiple lesions. And that indicates that the, um, t the infection has disseminated through the bloodstream. And that doesn't mean it's multiple tick bites. It's one tick bite, but patients can get multiple lesions. So that's phase, that's stage one. Um, phase two is uh, termed early disseminated disease. This is the type of, um, of manifestation that occurs days to months after a tick bite. And it could be the first manifestation of Lyme because the first phase of disease could be missed. So you, if someone could have an erythema migraines rash on their buttocks. And if you're not, no one's looking at your buttocks regularly, you know, to see that the rash is there, it could be missed. And those non-specific symptoms could be chalked up to having a cold and it goes away. So in early disseminated disease, we see um, three major types of complications. The first is cardiac inflammation, and the classic manifestation of this is heart block. So patients will have um, abnormalities in, kind of their, in their EKGs, and that's the first sign that, that there's an issue. Neurologic involvement um, can be seen in about 10%. Um, this includes meningitis, Bell's palsy is common. We see that a lot over the summertime. Um, and then spinal nerve root inflammation. And then Lyme disease can also cause ocular manifestations, conjunctivitis being the most common, and then there are also some more rare um, manifestations of that. The third phase of Lyme disease is termed late disease, and this is the type of disease that, or the type of symptoms that occur months to years after onset of the infection, and again, may be the first manifestation of Lyme. Um, the most common of these is arthritis. And this um, is characterized by intermittent or persistent arthritis and a few large joints. And the most common would be the knee. Um, neurologic manifestations can also be included in this phase. Um, and symptoms, um, or, or symptoms of this is like some cognitive slowing, memory impairment, um, very subtle stuff, um, and sometimes peripheral neuropathy, so like pins and needles um, in your extremities. There are some post-Lyme disease syndromes. Um, these are um, syndromes with nonspecific symptoms, headache, muscle and joint egg, aches, fatigue, occurring within six months of a Lyme diagnosis. Um, and for most people who are infected with Lyme disease, symptoms improve gradually over six to 12 months. These post-Lyme disease symptoms can occur in five to 15% of patients. Um, but a cur currently available evidence does not support the hypothesis that persistent infection is the cause of these symptoms. It's a very important point. So this is not active or untreated Lyme disease, and I think that's a big misconception in the community um, that, you know, if you've had Lyme disease in the past and you still have some of these symptoms several months later, it means that your Lyme disease is untreated, and that's actually not true. 
So the diagnosis of, of Lyme disease um, is made differently depending on what phase of disease you're in. So in early Lyme disease, that's the easiest for us because if we see a bullseye rash with a history of tick exposure, we don't even do blood testing. And the reason why is because the blood test can actually be negative very early on in disease. So if we see that with the, with the exposure and the symptoms, we just treat for Lyme disease. The diagnosis of early disseminated or late disease is based upon clinical syndrome in a patient who has been in an endemic area with a positive test. So again, stages, phases two and three, we do blood testing. And testing should only be performed in these patients. So Lyme testing is not indicated for screening of asymptomatic individuals living in endemic areas, patients with nonspecific symptoms only. Um, be, that's, this is because serologic testing in these patients with a lower likelihood of disease results in more false positive results. So we get a lot of um, interesting cases of, uh, of this in the office that, you know, some patients claim that they need their yearly Lyme test because they live in Connecticut. And that's just not advised because, you know, it's, again, it's, n it's not approved as a test for screening. Um, and if you don't have symptoms, there's no need to test. So what do we do to test? So uh, we use the two-tier approach, and this is what um, is supported by the CDC and the IDSA, which is the Infectious Disease Society of America. Um, so um, it's a screening ELISA test followed by a Western blot test. So um, to kind of keep it simple, if your screening test is negative, you're done. You don't have Lyme disease. If your screening test is positive, we go to a reflex test, which is called the Western blot, which I think is kind of more of a common term. If your Western blot is negative, you don't have Lyme disease. And if your Western blot is positive or interpreted as positive, that shows, that's evidence that you've encountered Lyme. Um, this isn't, the Western blot test, or all of these tests are antibody tests. So antibodies are part of your immune system, and that's your memory. So your antibodies for Lyme can persist for years after your Lyme disease has been treated and cured, because that's just basically your body's, your immune system's memory that, hey, I've been exposed to Lyme disease before, and I've been treated, and that's all it means. So another reason why we don't recommend serial testing because the test can still show up as positive and that leads to a lot of confusion and anxiety for patients and so just you know important to remember that it, it's okay if it stays positive so how do we treat Lyme disease um, so for early disseminated disease the bullseye rash we typically our, our treatment of choice is doxycycline an antibi very common antibiotic uh, typically 10 to 21 days of therapy is appropriate. Ten, a lot of studies show that 10 days is fine, contrary to popular belief. Um, I typically treat my patients for two weeks. Um, some, pa some of my partners treat patients for about three weeks, but usually not longer than that for early disease. Um, doxycycline is actually preferred because it also has activity against co-infections that were mentioned earlier. So anaplasma, or previously known as ehrlichiosis, is also treated with doxycycline. And these ticks can carry ehrlichiosis, they can carry Lyme, and they can carry babesiosis all in one tick. So oftentimes when we are testing patients, we test for all three because co-infections are actually common. Amoxicillin is another option um, if for, in those individuals who can't tolerate doxycycline um, and for children um, or cefiroxime. Um, for children under the age of eight, the recommendation is to use amoxicillin, although pediatricians are now changing the tune and saying that doxycycline can be used um, if it's 100% necessary. Um, and for pregnant or lactating women, we do not use doxycycline, so we use the alternatives. <laughs> if there's evidence of a, a disseminated disease, so meningitis, um, heart block, um, we, the recommendation is to get IV therapy, and that's typically for two to four weeks. Um, extending therapy with antibiotics does not enhance efficacy, and the majority of patients see a resolution of symptoms within 20 days. 
So what do you do if you have a, find a tick on you this summer? So this is a very common question. I actually just was getting bombarded with texts from a colleague with the same question right before I came up here. So, um, so these are the, the if all of these criteria are met, then um, this is these are the individuals that should get um, prophylaxis. So the attached tick um, is identified as Exodia scapularis. Um, the tick is attached for greater than or equal to 36 hours, and that can be determined by the degree of engorgement or time of exposure. So again, it takes 36 to 48 hours for that transmission to occur. Um, and so that's why that's the recommendation. Um, the prophylaxis can be begun within 72 hours of the tick removal, and the local rate of infection of ticks with uh, Borrelia is greater than 20%, and doxycycline is not contraindicated because the only antibiotic that's really effective for prophylaxis is doxycycline. So it's a big, child, a big question when it comes to children under the age of eight. Um, you really have to weigh the risks and benefits of giving children doxycycline in this type of situation. So if all the criteria are met, then the recommendation is to treat with a single dose of doxycycline to help prevent acquiring Lyme disease from the tick. So prevention, how do we, how do we pr protect ourselves? This has been already um, touched upon, but proper clothing, clothing again, can't be stressed enough. Long sleeves that button at the cuff, pants tucked into socks, light colored clothing. Um, form the habit of inspecting your skin, your children's skin, um, when they come in from outdoors. Check the armpits, groin, backs of the knees, the belt line. Um, showering after coming in from outdoors, so a vigorous scrub can remove ticks. Um, DEET can be effective against ticks, um, but also, uh, as was mentioned before, permethrin, which can be used on clothing. Thank you. So with all that, um, what are we doing in Darien? Uh, first of all, we'll talk about ticks. We do take ticks, we do send them in for testing. Um, we're running an infection rate of about 30% we're seeing now, maybe even more this year, and it seems to go up a little bit every year. So um, you can bring in the uh, ticks for testing to us, as I said. Um, with respect to mosquitoes, we have two testing stations here in Darien. Um, you want the good news about that or the bad news? Well, you're going to get it both. Every year, there's positive mosquitoes for West Nile virus. Every year. Um, and I know I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. So far, we haven't had any cases of illness associated, reported with West Nile. And getting back to ticks, the other part of the tick equation is, is that Tick-borne diseases are reportable diseases to the local health department as defined by the state health department. So if someone has a blood test and they're positive for Lyme, we, are, we get the reports in the health department. So we can tabulate and track the occurrence of <clears throat> documented laboratory confirmed cases of Lyme. But we don't know anything about the cases of Lyme that are just treated because of the identifying factors as described by Dr. Shah. So we know that cases of Lyme disease are probably way underreported because we're in the single digits with Lyme disease consistently here in Darien. And yet we know that there's ticks and ticks everywhere and there's a lot of anecdotal stories about folks who are dealing with the ravages of, of Lyme disease. So with that, what I'd like to do is ask our three presenters to come up to the front and answer any questions that y you might have of them. And I'm assuming there are questions. Yes. First of all, thank you for the excellent presentations. Uh, gave me a good degree of clarity. I feel like I've been watching a 1950s monster movie tanks are coming and the monster keeps coming. Um, but I, my question has to do with, um, particularly with tick 
bites. Is it possible that it can be in your body with no symptoms for a very long time and it may be underreported on an annual basis because we carry it longer than we think? Can it go dormant for a while? Let me answer that. So um, you can probably hear me without this, but um, so so I don't believe that that's the case. I think it's a common misconception about Lyme disease. Um, I'm assuming that's what you're referring yes. to. Um, that you know it goes dormant and then it activates and then it goes back dormant again. There are many infections um, that that is very well established about certain viruses, um, but Lyme disease is not one of those diseases. So. You know, the majority of patients who have a diagnosis of Lyme disease and are treated, the symptoms resolve. And those who have those symptoms, you know, several months to a year later, um, it's, there's no evidence that shows that that's ongoing disease. Um, you know, I don't know if it's well established why those symptoms can persist. But what's known is that you know giving antibiotics or continuing to treat as though an active infection doesn't make much of a difference because it's not ongoing active infection. No, there's. Oh. <laughs> uh, you said uh, you would take a shower and scrub. My understanding is once the you know, once the it attaches, you're supposed to be very careful how you get out of it. And it sounds like you can just scrub them off. It, your kid or something. Yeah, taking shower uh, is important, but not uh, for the sake of taking shower. Uh, when you are taking shower, you tend to pay attention to your body, and if there are ticks, you remove those ticks. The most important thing, as we emphasize tonight, is to be uh, careful and do very diligent tick check. That is the important, not just taking shower. Because once they are attached, you are absolutely correct. They won't go away with shower. Yes, sir. Uh, for the moment you are beaten, how fast does the disease spread? Five, seven days make a, makes a difference to start the treatment? Yeah, could I, could yeah. You so I, I believe the question is, um, after being bitten by a tick, um, is there a danger in, t in waiting for treatment if, in <clears throat> fact, th that there is Lyme disease? Is that your question? the reason you wait is because now it's taking eight days to get the result. Right. So, so no. The answer to that question is no. And my recommendation is, is you know, if there's a question about... So pe people who submit the ticks find them, right? And if there's a question about the time period what the, of the, the tick being on your body or you can't tell how engorged it is, my recommendation is to wait for the testing results from you know, the Department of Health before starting treatment, and that's fine. You know, that weak span of time is not, does not put you in any more danger from, from getting the Lyme disease. So to answer your first question, you're talking about a blood test for your daughter, not for testing the tick. We tested the tick, and the result came back positive. So we had Lyme on the tick. Right, but your daughter's test was negative. So we don't test all people who've had tick bites who have no symptoms. So not all patients or p people who are bitten with ticks that test positive for Lyme disease get Lyme disease or any of the other tick-borne diseases, right? Because if the tick was only on you or the person for less 
for let's say 12 hours, it's not enough time for the tick to transmit the disease. And so that doesn't necessarily mean you know, just be, if your if your daughter had a tick bite and it was completely symptom free thereafter, my recommendation would be no testing, right? Because again, we only test patients who have clinical symptoms in addition to tick exposure, in addition to living in an endemic area, which is this area, right? Our rates thirty percent, but but that those are the individuals who should get tested. I also would like to add that. Uh, tick testing, uh, even though this is not a good advertisement for, for our program, uh, you really shouldn't view the tick testing as the final result. Tick testing or tick examination is important to determine, as Dr. Shaw indicated, to determine the engorgement status and the species. Otherwise, the tick testing result is one piece of puzzle that can only be used in conjunction with other line of evidence, including symptoms. A positive tick could be, end up making a resident sick, and in other cases, it may not be the case. It is not just the duration of tick attachment. There are a number of factors are also involved that makes a tick uh, competent to transmit the disease agent or not. And once again, the emphasis is that it is important to know what tick that uh, you have encountered, but it is not enough to use that one as a proxy to convince your doctors to uh, come up with a treatment plan. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Yes, um, How helpful are these spraying services that go around to spray your yard? What chemicals are they putting out and how long would they last? Uh, if, the, uh, if you are asking a professional uh, pest control uh, to come up and, and spray your yard, that spraying should continue for several rounds throughout the tick active season. If you do it once, it is not going to, going, going to be effective in order to uh, control tick population because as I described during my presentation, ticks have two years life cycle and you are, as the season progresses, you are dealing with cohorts of adults, nymphs, and sometimes larvae, and you have to keep uh, control and take population. I don't believe much in spraying the area because as we discussed, we have uh, ticks everywhere. So perhaps the best way is just prevention and keeping, uh, or, or in other words, uh, being aware of your, your surroundings and avoiding tick infested areas. Yeah, you are asking very difficult questions. <laughs> uh, so if I say they are not effective, uh, perhaps it is underestimation. But what I could tell you, they are not as effective as synthetic uh, tick control agents like pyrethroids. So we cannot rely on those uh, natural products in order to uh, control tick population. So if you are using those products, it means that you are somewhat uh, exposing yourself to uh, tick bites. So is it fair to say that you get a lot of discussion about repellents, but do repellents simply send the tick from you to your neighbor, where they actually <laughs> reduce the population of ticks? No, they, they just repel the ticks. They, it so doesn't... We know, so we have a growing population, and we, we find ways to repel them. But from your, in your estimation, what things can we actually do to reduce the population of ticks? Well, I think that the most important thing is, is at your backyard, is in, in the neighborhood. You have to come up with means to keep 
the wooded area rather organized and orderly so that rodents will not be active in your backyard. Furthermore, if at the community level, if you could uh, come up with barriers that you could uh, keep deer away, that would also help. We here in Fairfield, a couple of years ago, we had a CDC funded uh, project uh, in Reading, uh, Connecticut, and we were able to show that uh, implementing uh, or keeping the air away and keeping your backyard tidy and organized help to reduce the tick population. But it has to be done collectively at the community level. You are correct that if you keep your yard clean, it's not going to help if your neighbor is not doing the same thing. You will have a spillover from your neighbors. But please do not go and fight with your neighbors. <laughs> Challenge for those of us who are managing the population So my understanding is that generally there's overuse of antibiotics. Like my pediatrician regularly prescribes antibiotics for an ear infection, even though everyone pretty much knows that like 90% is caused by a viral infection. So I guess my question is like is doxycycline more like a much more powerful type of antibiotic that could that's harmful, but why is there a hesitation to not just just to be safe, prescribe it um, versus like if, if there's a question about like all the factors you mentioned in determining whether to treat. Um, so the, the very reason is what you just stated is because there's there's an epidemic in this country of over prescription of antibiotics for whatever ailment you know that that you could name. And um, that's why we're seeing the emergence of superbugs, right? We read in the New York Times about Candida auris and CRE and all of these super resistant yeast infections and bacterial infections that we're seeing in hospitals and healthcare facilities. And a lot of that pressure is being driven by overprescription of antibiotics. And so, and, and antibiotics in general, come with their risks, right? There's, you know, risks of, of um, you know, allergic reactions. Um, doxycycline can give you a pretty wicked sun rash in the summertime, um, which has to be considered in patients who take it. Um, and there's other um, super infections with colitis, C. diff, all of these types of things that can really wreak havoc on an individual's body. So. You know, we, we don't take prescription of antibiotics lightly in the infectious disease field. We always, the joke when you come into our office is that the, the least likely person that you will get to prescribe you an antibiotic is an infectious disease specialist because we really have to, you know, weigh the risks and benefits. Um, and so, you know, our, our, we like to prescribe it when it's only necessary. But we're still constantly finding, uh, he takes the next card, we give that monthly, the, the vitamin, the pill for prevention. But we're still constantly finding dead ticks around. And I guess they're not actually biting, but just repelling. And you know, it's, it's a concern, it's a fear. And one thing we do is just try not to have them sleeping close to us or on our bed or you know, um, near the children. And just, we check him, we check our children, but it's been a reoccurring, even with still, you know, the Lyme disease vaccination he gets every year and his prevention every month, it's still pretty bad concerning, you know, the amount of ticks we keep finding um, and disposing of. So can you speak to any of that, like in terms of for our pets and just protection and prevention, and are, are we any closer to Lyme disease vaccination for our babies? So the, the last part of your question I can answer, there, there is a Lyme disease vaccine um, in development and the prediction is that it would possibly be available in the next five years. Um, but before that, there was a Lyme disease vaccine, you know, way back 
um, not way, way back, but before I started practicing medicine. Um, and um, it was taken off the market just because it wasn't very effective. But there is one in, in development. There's research ongoing for that. In terms of the pets, I would defer to. <laughs> I'm not a pet person. <laughs> yeah, uh, you are absolutely correct with regards to number of ticks that uh, pets carry. So I think that the most important thing or the most important approach that you can take to make sure that you uh, do tick check. It is uh, th that uh, it, that tick check not only protects pets, it also protects children around you. That's the only advice that I could offer at this point because it just, because pets, you know, they are, they are more active than, than children and when, they, when, when you are taking them out. And you also have to make sure when you, you are taking them out, uh, keep on leash and make sure that they don't go to the bushy area, tall grasses and wooded area. It is hard to control, but that's the only uh, way that you could, you could keep ticks away from them. You can check the label too, what it's active, like what it's mode of action is. If it's a product that kills ticks on the dog, then it would be working. If it's supposed to repel, then I don't know why you're finding it. Like, you, you want to see exactly what the mode of action is. Yeah, um, it's for, I think it's more fun than ticks, so I think he's attracting them and he has a long hair. Yeah, so like I said, if it's a if it's a pill it's taken and the tick bites the dog and the tick dies, then, <laughs> then what you're doing is working. But you, you want to check the label to see what it's actually supposed to be doing. We have time for one more question, <coughs> I think. I just had a question about when you talk about the clothing you have to wear when you're walking in a wooden area. You know, if, if, um, what about head covering? You have to be concerned with ticks falling off of like squirrels and things. Are they not squirrels? Yeah, ticks do not fly. They don't jump. Uh, they just uh, rest on on grassy on grasses, grassy area. And when you are or your pet is passing by, they just cling on you. So you don't have to be worried about jumping or flying ticks. Therefore, you don't need a head cover. Perhaps you don't even need to cover your sleeves if you are not actively dealing with, with grasses with your hands. The most important thing is, is, is the pants that, that you have to have a light colored pants and tuck your pants into your uh, socks. How do they get to the head then? Well, they, once they attach to, to your uh, legs or the areas that, that have been exposed, they just walk and, and get to your head to moist area. They crawl right up. So David, I would like to extend appreciation to Paula. She was very pioneer. She has been working with us for many years and has been very supportive of the community as well as supporting of the experiment station. Please extend round of applause. Exactly what I was going to say. And one more thing I want to say about mosquitoes, and that is check your gutters on the house. That's a very common place where the water sits stagnant because of leaves and debris that's up there, captures the water, stays there, gets warm. That's an ideal breeding, breeding place for mosquitoes. So make sure the also gutters. Corrugated rain spouts. Corrugated rain spouts that direct the water away from your foundation. Another play. I have one at my house. <laughs> Get rid of that thing. But uh, those gutters too. Make sure. It's. But anyway, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank these folks for being here. Um, this will be available on uh, Channel 79 at some point in the near future. We'll have a link to from our website to it. Um, and uh, again, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Paul.